This is the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, and I'm your host, Ryan Ray. Thanks for tuning in. On today's show, we had the pleasure of having on Mark LaCour. If you're not familiar with Mark LaCour, let me give you a little bit of information about him. In Mark's career, he sold over $305 million to the oil and gas industry and has had over 2,200 meetings with almost every oil and gas company that you can name. He's done business in the North Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, the UK, Middle East, Mexico, Canada, Norway, Scotland, Brazil, and the good old U.S. of A. He is the Director of Public Relations of the American Petroleum Institute, the API, Houston chapter, the largest group representing the oil and gas industry to Congress. And he has a well-earned reputation as an industry insider and an independent third-party market researcher. He is an author, sits on several oil and gas boards, and has one of the top oil and gas presences in social media. And when not volunteering his time teaching STEMs at local schools, he helps other companies sell their products and services to oil and gas companies at moldapoint.com. For more information about Mark and all that he does, check out the show notes. It'll all be linked up there. In my conversation with Mark the other day, we talked about all kinds of stuff. We got into the presidential election, OPEC, the old downturn over the last couple of years, and renewables. And so without further ado, let's get to it. Well, Mark, you know, when I started this podcast, I was hoping to get on big names, but I felt like bringing you on for the first episode, I've almost peaked. Thank you so much for coming on, and uh, it's good to have you on. Yeah, awesome to be on, Ryan. And, and you know what, Ryan? Hats off to you for pulling this off. This is awesome. I, I can't wait to see you be successful. Well, I appreciate that. So let's get right into it. This is being recorded just a few days after the U.S. presidential elections. What are your thoughts? You know, there's a, been a lot of debate on the Trump and Hillary, and we ought to get into the social side of things. But just from an oil and gas and energy perspective, what are the markets telling you right now? Um, it's funny. The Houston Chronicle called me the day after the election asking the exact same thing. Um, so from an energy point of view, this guy's on point. Um, he is open up federal uh, lands to drilling. He's going to remove the teeth from the EPA. He's going to rescind all the stuff that, that the current administration has in place that hurts the oil and gas industry. And let me tell you something that's really, really cool that nobody quite gets yet. His inter- interior secretary on his cabinet is going to be Lucas from Lucas Oil. His energy Secretary is going to be uh, uh, Ham, the CEO of Continental Resources. For the first time in over 30 years, we're going to have people that are in the driving seats of our national energy policy that actually work in the energy industry. They're not politicians. You know how big that is when you actually have people that work in the energy industry now looking at the rules and regulations? It's We haven't released our forecast yet for uh, 2017. That's going to happen at the end of this month. But one of the things we think is going to make it is for the first time in an unbelievably long time since the 70s, we're going to have um, a, a government in place, um, both from executive leadership and from a House and Senate, that is pro-oil and gas and pro-energy. So you're going to see legislation get changed. You're going to see – um, all of the uh, handcuffs have been put on this industry. You can see a lot of them removed, which is going to lower the cost of doing business. And in this long-term hydrocarbon abundant world that we're in, it's going to be good. It's going to add margins to everybody's bottom line. So, um, you know, just strictly speaking from an energy point of view, this guy is going to make some things happen. Well, you mentioned something there I want to touch on, actually, you know, lowering restrictions to uh, make business more effective. Obviously, anybody who follows the oil and gas sector knows that the industry is in a a downturn right now, you know, prices, I haven't looked at them today, but I'm sure probably mid forties if I had to guess. Um, and we've been there for a while. It's been a rough couple of years for the oil sector. Let's kind of go back and look at what happened over the past two years and how did we get to where we're at? Yeah. So a lot of people don't understand what happened. A lot of people want to blame OPEC and what they don't realize is OPEC did nothing, nothing, right? They just didn't cut production. And there's a lot of misunderstanding on why they did that. And, and OPEC's very smart. They knew that if they didn't cut production, that prices would fall, right? So they did it on purpose. But the reason they did it is they weren't trying to put the U.S. frackers out of business. No, OPEC uses oil the same way the United States uses battleships and tanks. It uses a weapon. And so they have some enemies in the Middle East. And so they wanted to stick a knife in their back. And at the same time, they don't like Russia because Russia supplies the arms for their enemies in the Middle East. So they decided to stick a knife in Russia's back. Both uh, countries are highly dependent on the price of oil to run their government. So OPEC was literally using the price of oil as a weapon. Now you go, well, that's not fair. A lot of people lost their jobs. What a lot of Americans don't understand, that's the whole reason the Soviet empire fell in the 80s. Ronald Reagan did the same thing with the cooperation of Saudi Arabia. The global oil prices, which caused the fall of the Soviet Union. So using that as a weapon at that time, was a good thing to do. And, and at that downturn, you know, a lot of uh, oil and gas people lost their jobs, but they come back. It's the same thing's going to happen with this one. Now, the only thing that's different is OPEC miscalculated 
And, and basically, if you don't know this about OPEC, OPEC has very cheap oil to get out of the ground, but they have this huge social cost. If they can't keep their youth employed, they know the youth will radicalize, and that will overthrow the government. And they know this without a fact. So they have all these huge construction problems, all these social um, projects that they fund to keep their youth employed. Well, that money typically comes from oil revenue. Um, Saudi Arabia um, has a what's called a – uh, 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 damn, what's it called? It's called a um, – Sovereign wealth fund. So it's basically their savings account. And so they knew they would have to dip into their savings account during this low crude price, but they figured once the price rebounded, they would put money back in. They miscalculated. So they had to pull money out of their savings account, but they're not going to be able to put it back in because the prices are going to stay low for an extremely long period of time. And so what's happening is we, I, we, we predicting that you're seeing the beginning of the destabilization of OPEC. OPEC's going to lose control on its ability to control uh, – global crude prices. And I I honestly think that's a good thing. I think it needs to revert back to where it's more of a free market type of deal. Well, you mentioned two things there I want to hit on. Um, and so the first is, if you look back at the downturn, you know, you have OPEC who didn't cut drilling. And the U.S., as the, as the numbers I've read at least, it seems to indicate actually outpaced them in drilling oh, of over course. the past two years. And the part that nobody understands is the way the contracts are written between the leaseholder and the operator is they guarantee production. So basically, the leaseholder is letting you drill on his minerals and he wants a guaranteed production so he can make a guaranteed amount of money and that has nothing to do with the price of crude so even though the price of crude drop a lot of countries thought you'd see u.s production drop but contractually they couldn't and then some u.s companies countered the drop in crude by increasing production so they had more volume and so no you didn't see production drop like a lot of countries thought it would the other thing uh, ryan that a lot of people don't understand is our shale plays are relatively easy to turn on and off. And then, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated, but it, it's, it's, we can respond very quickly uh, to crude price fluctuations. So um, I predict that we're actually going to be the next swing country. We're going to be the next OPEC, us, U.S. Well, that would be interesting to see. Uh, and I think there's a lot of validity behind that point. And as far as the, the swing state, as you mentioned, uh, I think it was like a year and a half ago, prices jumped up to maybe $60 a barrel. And all of a sudden, you know, I don't know, was it a couple of weeks? They, they went and they just crashed because all of a sudden rigs come online, production ramped up again, and then boom, just like that, it was it was over. Yeah, there's a lot of variables that go into that. There's a lot. Um, there's a perception variable, right? If the traders think the price could go up, they start trading differently, which actually causes the price to go up. Um, the thing to look at is uh, global supply, global demand, and the growth in that global demand. What does that growth number look like? The problem is you can get really good accurate information out of uh, the U.S. and Europe, and quite frankly, the information that comes out of the Middle East and Russia and China are lies. And so it, it's hard to figure out what those numbers actually are. Um, the, we're looking at a steady but slow growth in, in demand. Um, we're, we, you, know, you and I both have seen this oversupply shrink back down. Um, we're going to be in the 50 to $60 a barrel range for a very, very long time. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. This this downturn, like every other downturn before, it drives efficiencies in the field. And this time, it's a little bit. It's actually a lot different um, because for the first time in my twenty years in this industry, a lot of those efficiencies are being driven by technology and new technology. And technology is going to uh, drive the price of uh, exploration and production to lows that, that nobody's ever seen before. So, which means your margins still be healthy at fifty to sixty dollars a barrel. Right, and that's good news for everybody. Um, go back to one thing you said just a minute ago um, about the future of OPEC. Do you do you see OPEC as it stands today as a, as a viable entity, or do you see those nations saying, "Hey, look, we just can't uh, participate in this in this anymore"? Because um, over the last year, you've seen some countries seem to have taken a bigger beating by being a part of OPEC than others. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. What happened is OPEC's strength is its ability for all its fellow uh, member nations to work together. So if OPEC as an organization um, decides to cut production, everybody has to cut production. If they decide to increase production, everybody has to go increase production. The problem is um, um, places like Venezuela, where the country's literally getting ready to go through civil war um, because they, they're starving. They, they can't feed their people. They're trading crude oil for beans and rice to feed their people. Countries like that aren't going to listen to OPEC. And once you have one, two, or three of the countries not listen, well, then you, OPEC starts to fall apart because their strength is the fact that everybody has to do things together. And and we think that we're you're seeing the beginning of that happening right now, the destabilization of OPEC. 
And how long do you think that process will take? You think that's a one year deal or is it looking at maybe more like a decade before it kind of unravels? Yeah, it's going to be at least five years and probably closer to 10. Okay. Um, one thing else you've touched on is the, you know, these oil prices that, that, that they spike up and then you see, you know, hundred dollar oil for three, four years and then they go down. And, and from my standpoint, um, it seems that a stable price is better than a spike. I mean, we all make more money when the, when the price spikes, there's no doubt about that. But when the price goes down, you see a lot of interesting things happen. And some of it you, you've touched on already is, you know, technology. And I heard on your podcast the other day, um, you know, I think it was Schlumberger who's got the self-automated drilling rig coming out. And there's a lot of technologies that that, that force the industry to, to consider or to use or entrepreneurs that come in and say, hey, I can make some money here because these companies can't make money. But if I could save them money, then there's a spot for me. So what are you seeing that's coming out of this downturn compared to others, apart from technology just in general? So it's actually, there's several things. So everybody thinks I'm crazy. I think this downturn in 20 years is going to make the oil and gas industry look like Silicon Valley. I think it's going to be fast. It's going to be sexy. A lot of high tech, a lot of uh, very flexible workforce, a lot of entrepreneurs, small companies doing really cool stuff. I think the public obsession with the oil and gas industry will finally get straight and understand the prosperity and the benefits we bring. And like I said, everybody thinks I'm crazy, but 20 years we'll see. Um, so what's happening is you have this big knowledge drain that's going on. So the senior VP at Exxon that took a package because it's downturn, he started 35, 37 years ago out in West Texas on a rig. To this day, if they lose control of something, uh, uh, he'll go in his closet and get his hard hat and his boots and go out there and help him get control of that well because he's done it. The MBA that's going to replace him, super bright, super smart kid, he's never picked up a pair of tongs or torque wrench. He has no idea how to do any of that. So all of that knowledge, that, that ancestral, cultural, um, just unbelievably uh, valuable stuff is leaving the industry. And so that's happened at the same time. Um, that we are in a long-term hydrochrome abundant world, so prices are going to stay low. Um, at the same time that you're seeing politics change globally, um, our, our election's a good example of that. Um, and so what I, I think is going to happen is it's going to drive change in the oil and gas industry faster than it's ever happened before, but it's all positive change. It's all good stuff. Um, you know, you think about expensive oil, uh, uh, oil sands, uh, deep water, ultra deep water, high pressure, high temperature, all that's dead right now, Right. But it will come back as we develop the technologies to reduce those costs. Um, and, and so a, a lot of your listeners may not know this, but um, there is more oil and gas on this plant than we know what to do with. And we haven't even found it all. And what happens is we're able with new technologies to go in, like the shell plates. The shell plates aren't new. That's where the Rockefellers made their money. It's where Standard Oil was born in the 1900s, right? They had gushers. They'd dig 10 to 15 feet in the ground, all would come out by itself. And it stopped. And they go, oh, the fields are depleted. What they don't, what they didn't realize is they only got maybe five percent of the oil out of the ground. Fast forward to now, the same plays with a combination of an old technology called fracking and a new technology called horizontal drilling, a good operator can get another thirteen or fourteen percent of the oil out of the ground. That's eighteen percent. That means eighty-two percent of the oil is still there, Ryan. Which means in the future, I agree with most experts that more tech, different technology come out, which will allow us to tap more and more of that oil. And that's not a U.S. thing. That's the whole world. Think of all the capped wells in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Halliburton's already went out and fracked a capped well and was able to go into production as a proof of concept. Think about all the fracked, the capped wells. You so the hydrocarbons are everywhere. We're, we're, we're not in a shortage of them, um, and that's going to drive change uh, because the price is going to stay low. Well, and I got to do a little shameless plug here. That's the point of this podcast is to get on the best and the brightest, and let's let's hear about it because, you know, when I was in elementary school, I remember peak oil, and I'm actually working on a little – um, side post to get together about the myth of peak oil and you know the founding of that and you know yeah, it, Hubbard it, it was Hubbard right. Michelle and what happened is he 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 was, was doing the best job he could as a scientist what he did not have is a crystal ball he didn't see what the future would bring um, and and now we've realized that the future is bright for the oil and gas industry and it's and it's changing so not just the stuff I just talked about um, you may not know this but here and in Europe we use less crude oil and gas for fuel every year but we use the same amount. We're turning more of it into products. Um, anybody out there doesn't know the oil and gas industry, almost everything you touch came from this industry. 85% of everything that's in a hospital emergency room came from the oil and gas industry. The paint on your bicycle, the composites to make the blades for your windmills, the rubber for the tires on your car, all that comes from oil and gas. And we're using more and more of it to make products. So the demand is still there, but the, what we use it for is slowly changing. No, that's great. But, you know, 
when we look at the world today, there still is a bunch of myths about the oil and gas industry, and you know, peak oil is still is still out there, and it kind of it kind of surprises me because just a little bit of research will show that, yeah, good intentions maybe, but it's one of those things that's just kind of been used as almost a a scare tactic to kind of push us towards uh, other sources of energy. It's also it's there's also a, some cultural piece in there. So I have this conversation with people often, and I ask them. Do you ever worry about running out of sand to make glass out of? And they go, no. And I go, do you ever really worry about running out of iron to make steel? And no. And like, oil and gas is just another mineral, just just like same. So we don't think of the way picture oil. People picture oil and gas is like there's this bucket of it, and as you pull pull it out, there's less and less, and eventually you run out. But people don't think that way about sand or iron. And I say there is no bucket. That there is no bucket for oil and gas. So there, there's no right. limit. Yeah. And so it's it's the way people think about it, and a lot of that has been shaped by the anti oil and gas marketing efforts. Um, I don't like the anti oil and gas people, um, but I will give them hats off for being great marketers. So. Obviously, everyone in the renewable sector doesn't fall into the category you just described, but the renewable sector is a, is a hot buzzword right now. And, um, you know, when oil was at $100 a barrel, I felt like the green movement, the renewable movement was really, it really had its traction because oil was $100. People were saying it wasn't a viable option. Now, oil's sitting around 45 and people, you know, if the, if the producers can figure out a way to make this long-term productive like you're talking about, then... How will renewables play in the future if oil does stabilize at this 40 to 50 maybe $65 price range? Yeah, so the human species has always used a mix of energy, and it's constantly changing. Think about it. So our very first ancestors used biofuels, right? They burn wood. Um, that progressed to coal, and then what a lot of people don't understand is for a short period of time, we ran our industrial <laughs> engines on whale oil, which was very limited resource. Um from from whale oil, we discovered um, after whale oil, we discovered uh, oil and gas, and that mix will continue. Uh, wind energy is a great energy source. So is solar, um, and, and but they have issues. And so I, we will always have a mix of of energy supply. Uh, one of the things I think is really cool is here and in Europe, and actually starting in China of all places, which is hard to believe, um, they're switching from coal to generate electricity to natural gas. Just by making that switch, it's automatically 60% cleaner for the environment just by switching the fuel. So um, the renewables have their place. Now, unfortunately, especially in this country, politics gets involved, which is never a good mix. So there's something called the renewable fuel standard. Basically, it forces um, uh, downstream companies to mix ethanol with their gasoline, which ethanol is a competing product. It would be like the government, Ryan, making you mix another podcast as a competitor with you with your podcast. Right. And say you have to by law. Right. Yeah. And so what people don't understand is the only people that benefit from ethanol are the corn farmers that sell their corn at a government fixed price. Um, uh, ethanol is not a good uh, fuel for an engine. Gasoline is much better. Um, ethanol has problems. Uh, it pulls water out the air so you can't ship in a pipeline. So it's expensive to move. And the government subsidizes it. In the U.S., if you would quit the subsidy, it wouldn't even be able to function. So we need to remove that renewable fuel standard and let the market control that, um, just like we remove the cap on um, on export. So if 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 you let the free market control it, renewables ha definitely have a spot. And the other thing is, you also have to worry about energy density. So I'm sitting in my house in my upstairs in my office. Um, I have 3,500 square feet house. You know, I would need 35 or 40 kilowatts of generating energy and capacity just to run my house, right? That's a lot. Whereas you go to Vietnam, they want a, just enough electricity to run a light bulb and, and maybe a, a, a iPad, right? And internet connectivity. Well, you can do that with a small solar panel. You can't solar my house to the point that I get 24-7 support from solar. So you also have to worry about energy dis, uh, density in uh, whatever countries you're talking about. Um, but like I said, renewables have their place, absolutely. And, and you, know, um, you know, we're sitting here in the great state of Texas, which a lot of people don't know is the number one wind generating state in the U.S. and also the number one solar generating state. And we're an oil and gas state, too. So see, the mix right. works. Yeah. Right. You got it all covered. Well, look, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. What all do you need to plug? I know you got a couple podcasts. You got your business. You got your blog. You're, you're everywhere at all the at all the places at all the times, it seems like. So go ahead and plug it, and we will also listen to the show notes, but just get it out there for the audience so they know where to find you. And let me just say, if you don't know Mark, I highly suggest you reach out and try to meet him. He's uh, one of the best guys in the business, one of the nicest guys in the business. I'm actually jealous because everyone that I know that knows you, says that you're the nicest guy in the business and no one has ever said I'm the nicest guy in anything. So <laughs> I'm a little bit envious of you there. I've never been accused of being the nicest in any group I've ever been in period. So, but go ahead and plug what you need to plug and then we'll listen to the show notes so people can find you as well. 
Yeah, so it's um, I'd, I'd like if you listen to this podcast and you'd like to maybe listen to some other oil and gas specific podcasts, go check us out. So we have Oil and Gas This Week, which is the number one podcast in oil and gas, Oil and Gas HS&E. And coming soon, we're going to have Oil and Gas Leaders in the Industry and Oil and Gas Technology Podcast. So you can find all of that at the Global Oil and Gas Network, which is our new media hub for the oil and gas industry. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to me, the best way is hit me up on Twitter. Um, Ryan, if you can just stick my uh, Twitter handle in the show notes, they can find me. Okay. Um, but it's been a pleasure being on the show, and um, good luck to you. And this was, this was really fun. Well, thanks again, Mark. Good to have you on, and hope to see you soon. Yep, you will. Take care. See you. And thanks again to Mark for coming on. For more information about Mark LaCour, please check out the show notes. As I will link to everything there. And uh, until next time, keep climbing.